Dear colleagues, uh, dear chairwoman, it's a pleasure to be here and to give a talk on the acute hepatitis virus infection from A to E. And what I would like to focus on in my talk are some aspects to the frequency and some epidemiology data, something about the natural course and the risk of severe hepatitis and liver failure in these infections, what are the diagnostic challenges and treatment options with some new perspectives we have here. So I would like to start with hepatitis A virus infection and it's an infection, well, probably not very attractive. We do not have a lot to do with this infection, but this may change because as we have no universal vaccination programs in most of our European countries, our community and especially the elder population become more and more susceptible to this infection. And this shows the situation for the population in the age of 30 to 50. And you see this population is increasingly uh, susceptible to hepatitis A virus infection. And this can become a problem because older age, and you will see the data later, is a risk for severity of the, the hepatitis. And what we have seen, and this is also data coming here from Italy, that due to this increased susceptibility, we will see large outbreaks. And these large outbreaks are not um, introduced due to shellfish consumption or what we may think about. Because of these large um, and growing international food trade, um, frozen berries and in Italy, we have strawberries, but we know that there might be seeds from the pomegranate or whatever being contaminated and coming from China may be a source for large outbreaks. And this, I see um, the data here for the large um, outbreaks that have been observed some years ago in Italy. And you see how this infection may spread throughout Europe. Um, and you can see it in the next slide. It started in January 2013. And already after some months, you can see this infection coming up in other European countries as listed here. So during this outbreak, a total of 1,600 hepatitis A cases were reported. Um, and 70% of these cases were treated in hospital for six days. So m many of these patients were ill, really. And there were also two HAV-associated deaths observed. And what we also have learned in recent years, um, due to outbreaks we have seen in the MSM, in the men who have sex with men community, that hepatitis A should be also regarded as a sexually transmitted disease. And I only would like to show you one example coming from one of the metropolitan cities in, in Europe, but they have been seen in Barcelona, in London, in Amsterdam, wherever. And this is one from Berlin, and it was seen that within some weeks, these are weeks here during the year, there was a sudden increase in the number of cases reported to the authorities. And you see there were, uh, since November uh, 2016, 37 new cases. They were all male, and it turned out that 30 out of these 37 uh, were um, from the MSN community. And there are now more and more phylogenetic analyses of these outbreaks. And this is one from the Barcelona outbreak. This is from the Berlin. And when you compare these viral isolates from outbreaks in the MSN community seen in Berlin, Munich, Frankfurt, or in the UK, in Netherlands, Amsterdam, or in Barcelona, they all belong to the subtype 1A. And they are phylogenetically uh, quite close together. So it's more transmitting by traveling, having the parties on the weekend in these uh, European cities. So what about the clinical course? And is it a dangerous disease? You know, um, ultimately, most patient um, hepatitis A will resolve without sequelae. But there is a certain percentage, less than 1%, they may develop liver failure and uh, probably die. And there's a 
other way of a relapsing um, hepatitis A that can be seen in about 3 to 20 percent of patients, probably you're aware of this uh, situation that the patients are already recovering, the jaundice disappears, but then again jaundice um, is an, an increase in bilirubin, patients quite often suffer from itching and they have a rebound in viremia and ALT levels and this relapsing hepatitis A may last for several months. The longest case or the longest course I have seen was for nine months, so in a total this patient was ill with hepatitis A for nearly one year, but nevertheless it will not become chronic in a way that it persists for a year. What about disease severity? In the US they have now introduced a universal vaccination and they see that there's a declining number of hepatitis A um, infection in the US. But at the same time they observed that severity of hepatitis A is probably increasing. So you see here over time the number or the percentages of patients being hospitalized due to hepatitis A, and there's certainly a, a huge increase, meaning that the patients are more ill when infected, and this is probably a concern of the adults that we do see now more infection in patients at higher age. And although these curves are quite low here, there's a trend also to increased death rate. And I think this is clearly explained because um, here you see the death rate due to hepatitis A according to age group and death is what you see in the elder population and it starts above the age, let's say, of 30 but mostly at the age of 50. And I think this is very nice illustrated in a recent report coming from Taiwan where they had looked at a very large number, you see the numbers here, of cases they seen with hepatitis A virus infection, acute infection, and you see here the death rate. And if you're a child, if you're a young person, the death rate is really, as you know, less than 1%, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 is your less than 40. But then it increases to 3%, and if you're over 60, it's nearly 5%. And certainly this may have something to do with the regeneration capacity of the liver. And we know if you have an acute insult and you are older age, the likelihood that you recover um, is lower. And this holds true for every um, severe liver injury that may happen. Now we'd like to move forward to the diagnostics and this is in most cases quite easy. We have a serologic test, as you know, the IgM assay, and in a certain clinical situation of an acute hepatitis, if IgM is positive, you can make the diagnosis of hepatitis A. But there is an interesting observation about a window phase, so that there might be already some symptoms, so you diagnose something has happened with a liver, acute hepatitis, but antibodies are not there already or not at a certain level you may detect with your assay. And this was nicely illustrated also in a recent study from Asia. You see a large number of patients with acute hepatitis and 81% had this anti-HAV IgM antibodies so diagnosed as acute hepatitis A. But in 10% initially the antibodies were negative, but when, when retested some days or a week later, they become positive. And it turned out that these patients had probably characteristics of quite early stage of the acute hepatitis. Some of them had a fever or diarrhea and not so high ALT levels, lower bilirubin. So if you are in suspicion of an acute hepatitis and you do not find a uh, reason for, it might be useful to do a retest some days later to see whether there is an increase in anti-HAV IgM antibodies. On the contrary, not every positive IgM, hepatitis A IgM, means there is an acute infection. IgM antibodies per se are quite sticky, this holds true for, for all these IgM and they may occur uh, in many autoimmune diseases and it's quite interesting if you look at lab data, you know many people screen for viral hepatitis sometimes without really a good reason and therefore it turned out that only 10% 
of all positive anti-HAV IgM tests meet the clinical criteria of acute hepatitis. So it can happen quite often. So you must always ask yourself, is it really a clinical situation? So false positive IgM may occur and antibodies to viral hepatitis antigens can be produced in response to autoimmune clinical phenomena. Most of these patients had some kind of an autoimmune liver disease, um, not, not only liver disease, an autoimmune disease, and therefore stimulation of IgM antibodies. So I mentioned that, especially in the elderly population, um, hepatitis A may become risky and patient may develop an acute liver failure. So what's the clinical consequence? And to be honest, we do not have any treatment we can recommend. So what can, uh, can I tell you from the literature search? And there is one interesting observation, but this only in vitro data coming from Ralph Bartenschlager's lab in Heidelberg. And you know, there was some interest in silibinin in treating hepatitis C when we do not have the DAA. It's also the DAA and quite effective in treating hep C. And therefore, the lab was interested whether it had an effect on HEP A um, in the cell culture system. But you see, the intravenous silibinin had no effect. But quite interestingly, if you use the oral form, the silimarin, and this is uh, over the counter medication quite often used for patients with chronic liver disease, this was highly effective. And because this is a very cheap and very safe drug, I think if you're in a situation where you you're looking for a treatment, why not using this drug? And I think another um, treatment that, um, in my view, really should be considered are steroids. Um, it's not really quite intuitive to treat a virus infection with steroids, but we must be aware that in all viral hepatitis uh, infections, the disease we see is immune mediated. It's not a direct antiviral effect, uh, the, the damage of the hepatocytes. And there are a lot of case reports, small series, evaluating steroids in this situation. And I have to say, in Japan, all, nearly all patients with severe viral hepatitis were treated with steroids. It's a kind of a standard um, there. And here's a small study coming from um, children with severe and fulminant acute hepatitis A. You see there were 33 um, children. Some of them were treated with steroids, others not. It's not randomized, no high quality study. But at the end, if you look at those who survived instead of those who died, and you see the death rate was high in these patients with fulminant hepatitis A. Steroid therapy was independently associated with improved survival in this cohort. The last point, just briefly to mention, as I'm quite sure we will see more and more of these outbreaks um, and being confronted with patients having Hep A, you know there's post-exposure prophylaxis recommended for all people being in close contact. There's always a debate whether to use immunoglobulins um, or vaccination, and the recommendation is really go for vaccination. Also the immunoglobulins do not often contain enough anti-H AV antibodies because it's overall declining the prevalence of having antibodies in the community. And this is coming from Taipei. There was a large outbreak in the HIV community and therefore they decided to offer to their hospitals, to all HIV infected patients and, and vaccine. Um, um, let's say half of the patients or the persons agreed to be vaccinated, the other not. So they had a kind of a, a randomized trial or a controlled trial and you see in the vaccinated group there was no hepatitis A infection as comparison to nearly 20% in the unvaccinated group. Yeah. So you can really um, treat the target population or prevent infection by doing a hepatitis A vaccine, and this should be done within two weeks after having a contact to an index person. Now I would like to move forward to the hepatitis E virus infection. It's becoming increasingly important, as you can see here from the EU data, that in nearly all European countries except Italy, there's a sharp rise 
in the number of infection being reported. But this is not an increase of the infection, it's more an increase of the awareness. We are now testing more for hepatitis A um, from the prevalence data, um, seroprevalence, it seems that there's no increase in, in the prevalence of, of the infection. So this is mostly a situation of awareness. And I have to say, at least in Germany, uh, the E is the most common viral hepatitis we see. So we changed our algorithm. We do not start with A, B, C. We start first with E. In other words, we do it all together. But you know, some years ago, we started with A, B, C, and if it's negative, we go for E. I think this really changed. Um, you should consider E as the most likely viral hepatitis, um, according to the prevalence in your country. In most instances, the hepatitis E is not a severe disease, but there are some discrepancies. If you look at the data you have from Asia and, and Euro the US and the European countries, and here are data from the US liver failure study group, and they looked how often is hepatitis E in patients with liver failure, and it turned out it's only 0.4%, so very rare as a reason for liver failure and it could not be implicated in any case of an indeterminate autoimmune or pregnancy related acute liver failure. And I think this is in contrast if you look to the data in Asia where you have overall uh, a case fatality rate in the range of let's say one to five percent. This is a I think clearly of concern and especially in the pregnant women where you have about 10 to 20 percent case fatality. It's still not clear why in uh, pregnancy hepatitis E is so deleterious, but from data we have, if you compare the different acute situation according to baseline features, whether you are male, whether you are female, pregnant or not, it turned out that those um, being pregnant had higher viral load. So probably due to hormones, or I don't know, um, these uh, women have higher levels of replication and therefore a higher likelihood of acute liver failure. And another reason that may explain the discrepancy we've seen between Asia and Europe and the US, that we have different genotypes, e-genotypes in these different countries. And as you're probably aware, in Asia there's e, um, hepatitis E genotype 1 and 2 prevalent and being associated with more severe disease, especially in, in pregnant women, HIV 1, but not 3 or 4 is here associated with a severe cause. And there are now some very few cases of fulminant hepatitis with genotype 3, but this is really exceptional. And we know that um, gene, the variability and some genetic markers um, of the hepatitis E virus are really associated with clinical features, not only ribavirin resistance also, but also with the risk of acute liver failure developing chronic hepatitis. And this has been to be further explored. And the last point, probably explaining why disease may become more severe, is the underlying liver disease. And it really turned out in recent years that an acute hepatitis E virus infection may be a reason for developing acute and chronic liver failure. So you might have a patient with a liver cirrhosis well known coming to your hospital with acute and chronic liver failure and normally you do not think about an hepatitis E. We have seen in the last year a couple of patients and we now routinely check if a patient had a sudden deterioration of the liver cirrhosis was as E related and this may have even some uh, therapeutic implication. So you see the underlying dis uh, liver disease severity has an impact on the survival rate. And if you have a cirrhosis and acute E infection, the case fatality rate is nearly 20%. If it's only chronic liver disease, 7%. And if you have no liver disease, 5%. But again, these are data from Asia, mostly genotype 1 infection. Coming to the, some diagnostic challenges in hepatitis E virus infection. 
Um, you know, the virus can be detected in serum and stool some weeks before the onset of clinical symptoms. Then you have the IgM rise followed by the IgG. The problem here is that the sensitivity and specificity of the serological testing is not very high. We have a new clinical practice guideline from the ESL. Therefore, acute infections, they all include you should test for RNA because there might be some uncertainties with your testing. So I mentioned a situation where even IgM might not be present if you have a um, reinfection that may occur. Quite often in this reinfection you do not have IgM antibodies. And there might be also a situation that there's already no RNA present. You know, if you come late during acute infection, you will not find the RNA. And then you may made your diagnosis only on the IgM. But I have to tell from clinical practice, this is always some uncertainty if you do not have really the RNA, but then it may help if you test for IgG and you clearly see that there's a rise in the titer of IgG really confirming that this was an acute infection. The problem here with the test, and I wouldn't like to go into detail, is that you see, if you look at here, the detection limit according to certain standards, it's quite heterogeneous um, through this assay, and you can see here the different titers. And to summarize this study to make it more easy, the detection limit with these different assays varied up to 19-fold for IgM and 17-fold for IgG. So we really have no gold standard for the serological testing. And there were, as I already mentioned for hepatitis A, unspecific anti-HEV IgM testing. And on the contrary, there might be also acute infection where RNA is clearly present, but you do not have IgM antibodies. And this might be an issue of sensitivity or acute infections not leading to IgM response. Therefore, always check for the RNA. A few words to the treatment. I think it's already some years ago where it was shown that ribavirin is active. It was mostly used for treating chronic infection, but it also works in acute infection. This is a single case. You see this patient is in the process of developing severe um, yeah, liver failure probably with a um, decline in the prothrombin index to 40%, a rise in ALT, and then ribavirin was started and had a very nice response. There are other case series. You see here 21 patients with acute hepatitis um, E from France were treated and nine of them had a severe infection, so with an impairment of liver function already. And all patients had a good response, became HEV RNA negative, and all seven of nine patients survived the severe infection, two patients died. And here you see the problem. If you come late with your treatment in these two patients, treatment was initiated when the patients had already encephalopathy, and therefore they did not survive. The new guideline recommends that treatment might be considered in case of severe acute hepatitis or acute and chronic liver failure, as mentioned, and ribavirin is a treatment of choice. Again, also steroids are effective. And this is a funny case because this patient was treated by chance. It had an unclear hepatitis because it was not a immediately tested for E, they performed a liver biopsy and there were features of an autoimmune liver disease. And therefore they started steroids and you see the INR improved, ALT improved, and also HEV RNA improved under steroids. As I mentioned, it's not a deleterious thing to, to give steroids to these viral infection and you see the decline in, in bilirubin. Please be aware that it's not only a hepatitis virus infection. E-virus infection has a, uh, a topic to the, to the nerves. And you may have a Guillain-Barré syndrome, sorry, or a neurologic amyotrophy. Um, and this can happen without any liver disease. So neurologists must be aware of these symptoms and should check for hepatitis E. Well, I would like to come to an end and a few words to hepatitis B and C. I think here the most important part is whether we should treat or not. And the new guideline recommend 
that we do not need treatment for acute hepatitis B because it will resolve in 95% of the cases and therefore no treatment is recommended. The issue is here that only patients with severe acute hepatitis B should be treated. And here the issue is what means severe. And in the former guidelines and also in the comments, it was always written, well, severe means a significant impairment of liver function. And this was always an INR of greater than 1.5 or a prothrombin index of less than 40. In my point of view, this is very late in starting treatment. Therefore, I was very much in favor to have this here characterized by any coagulopathy, so early signs of liver impairment, because normally in a typical acute hepatitis, you do not see liver impairment in many patients, even if your ALT is high. So, but we do not have good data, and this is always a problem if you have guidelines and would like to make a recommendation. Really, nearly no randomized trials. This is one of the few randomized trials where treatment was compared to controls in acute hepatitis B, showing a survival benefit. Again, if you look at the patient, older age is a risk factor for dying, and also if you have no um, rapid response. But overall, and it was again clear, the early initiation of treatment was successful and helped to prevent the liver failure rate, uh, rate from, nine, uh, from 35% to 9 And there's sometimes a concern if you start treatment that you may influence immune response, that the patient have a higher risk to have persistent infection, not developing anti-HBS. But this, I think, is quite clear that this did this, this not happen. And from this very nice study, it was in the contrary shown, if you start early with your treatment, the likelihood becoming S antigen negative is even higher as compared if you start late into in, in the acute phase um, of the infection, as seen here with a cutoff of eight weeks. The last word to hepatitis C. And here we have no licensed treatment. And in the interferon time, there was always the debate, should we start early? Because we know then it's quite effective, better than in the chronic course. This, of course, changed with the availability of the DAA. But nevertheless, it's good to be reminded on the different um, yeah, characteristic or dynamics seen in acute hepatitis C virus infection, predicting who is going to develop a chronic cause or who is going to develop spontaneous clearance. And the RNA dynamics are uh, most useful in this respect. And normally you see, if you have a patient with acute hepatitis, you see here the ALT levels. In nearly all patients, in the beginning, a decline in RNA, beginning in, in the first weeks. But then in those becoming chronic, there's most likely a plateau and then again a rise, whereas in those having spontaneous clearance, there's a further decline in ALT. And those with spontaneous clearance more normally have a um, yeah, more pronounced acute hepatitis with higher ALT levels. And these are data from Peter Ferenczi from Vienna uh, doing a kind of a score, and you see having being at younger age, higher bilirubin level with a good EL28 um, genotypes. These are all several factors for spontaneous clearance. And if you have a rapid drop and a pronounced drop in the viral load after four weeks, so you can make some decision. Of course, it would be quite interesting if you could treat patients with acute hepatitis C and probably a shorter treatment duration is more effective. This is from a German data. No co-infected patient, I have to say. And here, all patients were cured with a six, six weeks of treatment. But I think it's nice to see here the ALT level between screening and baseline. And you see in most patients already within the screening period, they have a quite nice decline in ALT and many of them probably cleared the infection spontaneously. But some of them had a rise. And I think th these patients may benefit also from shortening the time of the disease. And some here with very severe um, disease may be really rescued with this type of treatment and had a shorter um, illness during this acute um, disease. You may think from a different approach, from a cost-effectiveness approach, and a treatment as prevention approach, whether your patient 
is at risk of transmitting hepatitis C or not. And you can see here, and these are data from the US, that treatment of acute hepatitis C in any case is at least cost effective. But if you are in a patient population with a high risk of transmitting the virus, it is even cost saving. And um, of course, it's not within the label, but I think here really as a treatment, as prevention is a, a good argument. So, dear colleagues, I would like to conclude, especially my comments to treating um, patients with acute hepatitis and when to start. You know, if you're at the peak of ALT, there's always a question, will a patient have an acute hepatitis and will resolve, will he become chronic? And I think the biggest concern is whether a patient will develop a hepatic failure. And with respect to timing of treatment, you may consider a very preemptive approach or a late approach if there are early signs of liver failure or if you're quite sure, but then you are late, well, this patient is really at high risk of dying. And my conclusion, my recommendation is please go for a more early treatment if there are early signs of liver failure. Probably the number needed to treat is a bit higher, but if you can prevent one liver failure out of five or even ten, this means no liver transplantation and so on, and you have very safe drugs, patients, you are not give any harm to them by treating them, I would really recommend this. But it's difficult to proceed with this um, position and I'm very interested in your comments and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>